Hi everyone, um, welcome to today's session on entrepreneurial management. In today's class, we're going to be talking about the small business decision in terms of your structure. So what kind of organization are you starting off? What is the form of ownership that you're going to have? What are the key things you need to know in terms of registering the business, in selecting a name, in determining if you want a manager or you want to just be the entrepreneur behind the business? And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to see is what are the key things, the basic things, the most basic things that would define success for your venture. So let's start with this quote. If you really look closely, most overnight successes take a long time. This is absolutely true. When you think about a business organization and you look at the most successful businesses, you look at Tesla, you look at Apple, you look like Microsoft, you look at Alphabet, you're really thinking, hey, they must have really put in the work for them to be as successful as they are. And that is absolutely true. Now, the question is, when do you need to start putting in the work? Do you start putting in the work when you already have um, some revenue? Do you start putting in most of the work when you already have employees? Do you start putting in the work when you already have some level of structure? Absolutely not. You start putting in the work from the very first day. So from the decision on what kind of business exactly you want to start with, you start putting in the work. From the decision of the type of business, that is when you start putting in the work. From the decision of the name of your business, that is when you start putting in the work. So for every successful organization, there's always the most basic decisions that they've had to make that determine how successful or otherwise they became. And those are the things that we're going to be looking at today. So in terms of organizing your business, and we're looking specifically at the organizational structure of your business, there are key things you want to look at. Based on the type of business, based on your goal as an organization, you would need to decide what form of business structure do I need? What, kind, what form of business ownership do I need? And so what we're going to look at over the next few slides would be what are the forms of business structures that are available or business ownerships that are available? What are the advantages to you? So do they fit in? to the idea of the business that you have or do they not fit do they provide more disadvantages than advantages to you um, as an entrepreneur and then based on that what are the key requirements that you need to actually start up this business for it to grow so we're going to come back to the slide but we're going to go through understanding what sole proprietorship is what partnership is what corporation is because these are the major three types of business organization structures or own forms of ownership that we usually would have and then for each of them we're going to see the advantages the disadvantages of them and then what you need to do in terms of registration and legalities to start up your business so let's start with the different forms so like i said earlier there are three major forms that we're going to look at we're going to look at the individual or sole proprietorship um, as we would see when we move on to the next slide this is one of the most um, common forms of business organization just because of how simple it is how easy it is um, the level of requirements and so much compared to the others um, the risk itself is not so bad compared to the others well depends which we'll talk about so you realize that a lot of people will first start off with an individual or a sole proprietorship then we'll talk about partnerships and the three major types of partnerships that we have general partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnership. And then finally, we'll look at corporation, um, which is a little bit more advanced than the others. And then we'll see it from the private corporation perspective, the public um, corporation perspective as well. So in terms of individual or sole proprietorship, like I said earlier, this is the most basic form of business organization. This is the oldest to a lot of times. This is the simplest. This is the first go to. So most times when you think, oh, I want to start a business, you're not thinking I want a partner. You're thinking, oh, I have a particular skill set. I have a particular passion. And based on this skill set and passion, I want to start a business. So in terms of sole proprietorship, it is very easy, straight to the point. There are so many advantages, such as it is simple, inex excuse me, inexpensive to start. So I can wake up today and say, I'm starting a business, choose a name, etc., register the company, and I'm good to go. The terms of documentations, there's literally almost not, well, compared to others, it's, it's very few documentations that you would need for a sole proprietorship. 
you as a sole proprietor you also have control over your business over your operations so especially when it's a business that has to do with skill sets not a product so mostly services um organizations that are service based you have all the control over the operations who do i attend to who are my customers what skills do we um provide in my business what are the things that we need to start if we need to close what time do we close what time do we start how much do i contribute so you have key decision in terms of all the key areas that need to be made when you are starting the business and even in the running and operations of the business and like the name sounds when in terms, in terms of profit all the profits will come to you the owner because of course you are the only person that is running the business now that doesn't mean that if you have a sole proprietorship you do not have employees you can absolutely hire employees as you grow but in terms of management in terms of um how centralized decision making is you'd realize that the sole proprietorship most of the decisions will be made by the manager or the owner then that also comes to tax simplicity in terms of taxes for this individual or sole proprietorship most times you're doing your tax with your regular income tax so when you're filing your income tax you put in the expenses for your business you put in all the information for your business you put in the profit from your business so you don't exactly have to you know do the entire big works get an accountant to file your documentations etc because it's a small business it's a sole proprietorship so what that means is it is part of you you have all the liability for that business and so everything the risk the profits the loss everything will go through your own income statement and that is really easy to do now aligned with that that also means that and this is from another perspective that also means that as a business owner if your company is having a loss especially in the first few years Technically, you are the one that is paying for almost of this. And so any gains that you get in terms of taxes because you're having a loss for your business automatically comes to you. So the expenses are deducted from your income because most likely you are at the one that is actually providing the resources, the financial resources for this business. So that is an advantage. But now let's go to the disadvantages of sole proprietorship and individual work so the first one is unlimited liability your company literally is you so there is no even if you have a name for the organization technically all the liability lies on you so if the company is doing great you are doing great because your finances are going high if the company is horrible or if it's going down if it's going to go into bankruptcy that technically means that bankruptcy is going to affect you so if there are any things that you're owing if you're owing a loan if the company is owing a loan or owing the bank or you've taken a mortgage on the company or anything that you've done on the name of the company and something happens so you go into bankruptcy etc that liability is transferred to you as the owner so you technically have all responsibility for this organization think about it as a child that is under 18 therefore everything that happens to that child technically is you so if for example the, the organization goes into a fraudulent case and um, it's shown that you might have had an idea or you didn't do your due diligence that fraudulent case comes to you as well you have to deal with it because that organization technically is under your control also in terms of this it means that you as an individual your tax rate might go up so for example if you're in a 45 to 60 thousand dollars tax bracket for your regular income if your company makes a lot of profit and makes let's say about fifty thousand dollars profit in a year your own tax bracket moves from 45 to 60 to 50 plus 45 or 50 plus 60 so your tax bracket moves all the way by 50 so that's about 95 to 115 for your own tax bracket because the company is seen as a part of you so that means that your tax rate also would go up also when it comes to finding equity so if you're trying to finance it you're trying to get people to invest in it a lot of times um investors might not exactly smile on a small business because technically they're not investing only into the business they're investing into you as an individual so they would rather invest into a corporation that the business itself is a sole entity on itself has its own legalities and not a sole proprietorship where if anything happens to you chances are that would affects the business so that comes back to some of our disadvantages again is if something happens to you if for whatever reason you are <clears throat> unable to run the business maybe you die god forbid or something happens to you what really happens is that business is most likely also going to close down 
except you've kept in so much structure where there's someone else that is able to take over. But anything that happens to the sole proprietor would affect the business. And so investors find it very difficult to actually put their money on a person. They'd rather put it on an organization and a person together. All right. Now, the next form of business ownership is partnerships. So partnerships, just like the name implies, is when there's two or more individuals that are carrying on a business for profit. So when two or three people come in together and say, hey, we want to start a business, but I don't want to have all the liability. I want to have a shared liability or I want to bring in more. Res <clears throat> I want to bring in more resources from other people. Then what they end up forming is a partnership. So the partners in a partnership are usually called the principals. And for you to actually have a partnership that works, the first one of the first documentations you need to create is a partnership agreement. So what the partnership agreement is saying is, this is my business. These are our this this is our business. These are the liabilities that we intend to take on. These are the roles we are going to take on. So assuming we are three, this person is going to be the chief executive officer. This person is going to be the chief financial officer. This person is going to be the chief technical technical or technological officer you list out all the skill sets that they need you list out all the information what liability seems like so in situation of um, bringing in resources how much are we all bringing in so i'm bringing in 20 percent. this person is bringing in 40 percent. the other person is bringing in 40 percent. so that means that if anything happens at the end of the business if anybody needs to go away from the business we can pay them off based on their equity percentage within the business. So that is what the partnership agreement is. Think about it as a binding contract that makes it easier for the business to run. So in terms of partnerships, remember I said there's general partnership, which is unlimited liability, there's limited liability, and then we're going to look at LLC as well. So in terms of general partnership, this is very similar to sole proprietorship. So pretty much the same thing. But instead of having one individual being the sole heir or the sole provider of the business, you have more than one individual. So exactly the same advantages that we'll have for sole proprietorship in the sense that there's some level of control, um, that there, it's a little bit simple compared to others. Those are the same things in general partnership. But now it's not just one person, it's two people or it's three people that have so much control over a certain organization. So advantages will be pulling up financial resources and talents. So one person is really great in finance. Another person is really great in marketing. Another person is really great in technology. And so three of us are coming together to start a business. What that means is we would be able to bring in our proficiency, bring in our experience, bring in our skill sets, and also bring in financial resources. If it was only me, maybe I could only afford $20,000 to come into the business as a capital. But now that we are three, maybe I can afford $80,000. So everyone brings 20, another person brings 40, another person brings another 20, and then we have enough resources to grow the business. There's also simplicity, like we said earlier, the documentations are easier, um, every information for this is easier there's increased ability to obtain capital so if you want to get a loan people feel more confident knowing that it's not just one person they're giving a loan to especially from the bank um i have my own credit rating the other person has their own credit rating and by the time we combine all of this together the bank might feel a little bit more assured that they will get their money back and there's also potential for growth because there are more people that are invested more people are bringing in the resources together to get this done so these are the advantages of general partnership but just similar to the disadvantages for sole proprietorship the first one is unlimited liability now remember with general partnership we're saying everybody literally is still the owner of the business so all three of you are the owners of the business so all three of you are technically the business in that sense if anything happens to the business every single person is going to have to pay for it so if the business goes into bankruptcy and is owing a hundred thousand dollars that hundred thousand dollars liability is transferred to the owners all three of them you have to decide maybe based on your general partnership agreement decide how you're going to pay it but that liability comes to you so if the comp company for example enter gets get, gets into a legal case or a legal um a defraud defraud a person or there's something against the organization it's going to to rub off on you as an individual or two or three of you as individuals so there's unlimited liability when it comes to general partnership and that also aligns with divided authority compared to the sole proprietorship where it's just one person the person makes all the decisions with general partnership where it's more than one person and there are two or three people that means we all would make decisions together and that might be a great thing because you know sometimes that means you have someone else to 
run ideas by things might work easier you might have different perspectives which should grow the business but at the same time that also means that there's divided authority and that means that if i say oh i'd rather we follow um maybe we get a loan instead but the other person says i don't want a loan for my business or for our business and so we have to decide amongst ourselves whose loan if we whether take a loan or would not take a loan so what that really means is there's some level of divided authority because people every one of us have to be a part of the decision making again based on what your partnership agreement states and that might make things a little bit slower it's not going to be as fast decision making might not be as fast as it was in sole proprietorship all right now moving on another form of partnership that is a little bit more structured than the general partnership is limited partnership so for limited partner partnership liability is limited to the extent of the partner's contribution to the capital of the business so in our agreement in our partnership agreement we've said um i have 20% of this business because i brought in 20% of the capital um xyz has 40% because he or she brought in 40% of the capital um another person has another 40% because he or she brought in 40% capital of the business and so what that means is when there is an issue when something happens if the business closes down if we are owing something everyone is going to be owing based on how much percentage they contributed to the capital so in this situation the most the basic advantage apart from all the most of the advantages that we've looked at here is the fact that you know that if anything happens i am only losing just the percentage of the contribution to the business i'm not going to have to pay from my own money or for my own income for anything that happens within the business it's only what i've invested into the business that i am losing now in terms of disadvantages the major disadvantage with this is there's a high level of difficulty when it comes to changing ownership so if one person says i don't i'm not interested in this business anymore or one person is not exactly in the right space of mind to continue managing the business or there's a conflict between the partners it becomes quite difficult for you to change the structure because a lot of documentations are involved you probably need to get a lawyer and that also means that legal fees which are really quite expensive will be brought into the conversation all right now the last type of partnership is a limited liability partnership now this is very similar to a limited partnership the only difference is this is more specific to groups of professionals and so at the end of the word for the business name for a limited liability partnership you see something like an llc for example so it's saying that every partner is limited to their ability uh, to their liability so at the end of the day it's just based on how much you've brought in um it's not based on you know it's not unlimited the liability is not unlimited it's more to how much you've brought in how much your contribution is to the organization um in terms of the structure it's mostly available to a group of professionals like i said earlier so a group of lawyers associates llc a group of accountants come together llc a group of doctors come together llc now the thing about this is it's a little bit more complicated than other forms of partnerships and so it's based on the laws and regulations for the province or the city that you're living in so for every city that you live in that will determine what kind of regulations that you might have for the business itself now the final type of business or business structure or business form of ownership is the corporation the corporation is the most widely used form of co- um, business ownership we're well, not most widely used technically it's the so business or so proprietorship that is the most used however corporation is the most structured and whenever you're thinking about an organization that has potential to grow and probably wants to get quoted and wants to be really big they would most likely be a corporation so the um the google the apple the alphabet like i said earlier the tesla the general motors um the other organizations that we know most of them you realize that they're all corporations so this is the most formal structure this is where everything is really pretty much aligned based on the expectations the most the highest expectations for a business the key advantage of a corporation is it's a separate legal um, separate legal entity from the owners so what that means is your business is on its own right it's it's a different name it pretty much has its own identity so think about it as you giving birth to a child that is already over 
So the, this child already has their own identity, has its own SIN number, has its own um, tax documentation, has its own CRA documentation, is technically its own entity. It has a continuous life. So if the managers or the owner dies, it doesn't mean the business closes up as well. The corporation has its own life, so it continues and can keep going as long as there's good management for the organization. In corporation, ownership is usually recognized through the purchase of shares so this could be either it's private or public even in a private organization if there's more than one owner you'd see that it's divided out so in my organization for example afrohub we are 10 co-founders and it's a corporation our percentage of ownership and shares is divided out based on our contributions to the organization at the beginning and so what really happens is for this organization everyone knows from the beginning that i have just sent in my own contribution but my contribution is more like an investment so that means that i can sell shares for my own part of the organization and get my money and move on and so the organization on its own has more stand in terms of collecting of loans or reaching out for equity etc there's more stands because we know that it is not tied directly to any individual it is standing on its own it is its own person and it has a continuous life now for sole proprietors once you start getting above of forty thousand dollars in revenue typically it doesn't exactly put, it's no longer profitable to you to have it as a sole proprietorship because that would mean that your tax bracket is going to jump really high for income that is not necessarily yours alone. So most times a sole proprietor, once he starts, he or she starts getting $40,000 or above, they would most likely incorporate their organization and make it more standard. Um, Non-for-profit organizations too are usually corporations. Um, they can usually do that, or apart from some, in some provinces, you can register just as a charity, but most times a lot of them will register as a corporation, but without a share capital. All right. So in terms of advantages and disadvantages, so the advantages are um, very similar to sole proprietorship, but the only thing is now there are more than one or two people. Um, advantage is also there's limited liability. So you know that your, if anything happens to the business, you're not going to lose your car, you're not going to lose your house, the business its own entity. If the business owner dies, if anything happens, you're not able to continue in the business. The life, the business has its own life. So as long as there's good management structure, the business will continue on. It's easier for you to raise capital because I know I'm investing into the business. I know I'm investing into something that has its own life, something that another person cannot wake up one morning and close. So that way it makes it easier for people to see the need to invest into the business. Also in terms of when you start hiring employees, you can be, you're able to provide employee benefits. There are also tax advantages to small businesses. Um, so there are tax breaks, there are things that you can apply for, which you wouldn't be able to apply for if it's a sole proprietorship. Then in terms of disadvantages, it's usually very expensive to run a corporation, um, especially the starting costs. So in terms of legal formalities. So I'll tell you, for example, for Afrohub, um, the cost we used to actually start the business in the first place was really high. So we, we spent into thousands just to register the business. Now that does not include, you know, the basic registration application that you're putting in through the BC government. It's just the information that you need, the lawyer that you need, especially when there's share, share, share structure and you have to divide out the share ownership. It becomes quite a lot for you to do at the beginning. So it's more difficult compared to other organizations. Um, also, there's an inability to flow losses through. So when there's a loss compared to a sole proprietorship, which you can take out from your own um, income, this you cannot do with a corporation. Now, it's very important for us to talk about intellectual property and not just every form of intellectual property, but a non-disclosure agreement. As a small business owner, chances are at the beginning of your business, you're going to be talking to a lot of people. You're going to be getting a lot of people's insights on specific things. You might need partners. You might have contracts that you have to form with other organizations or individuals. And so for you to ensure that your intellectual property, because your business hasn't grown yet, it is still at the most basic form of itself. So for you to ensure that everything about your business, your trade secret 
is even though you are sharing it with other people they cannot use it without your permission it's always advisable for you to sign a non-disclosure agreement which is an nda so an nda just allows you to share details of your intellectual property details about your business your trade secret with other people because you're looking for their input without you being afraid that, oh what if they start the same business what if they use my trade secret to grow their own business what if they invest in a business that is similar to mine or what if they use this against my own will all right so your nda your um, non-disclosure agreement pretty much just safeguards your trade secret safeguards your organization and safeguards all the information that you are using to grow your business now the next thing i want us to think about is how to choose a name for a business so choosing a name is also very important because you need it um, for anything that the business is related to, especially if it's a corporation. So in choosing a name, it's very simple to choose a name. You can do it by yourself. You can do it after, especially if it's a sole proprietorship. You can use your name. So I can say Debbie, um, but Debbie might be taken already, most likely taken already. So Debbie's, um, Debbie's cop business, you know, Debbie's cop organization. I can use my own name or you need to use a name that must satisfy the requirements of the register of companies in your province. So every province would have and every state and government will have their own regulations when it comes to re registering your names. And so they put out all this information there. You need to make sure that you're able to tick out all the boxes and it satisfies the needs that they have. The truth about registering a name, the most important thing is that the name that you are registering must be very clear on what exactly you're doing don't wait for people to have to start thinking oh what exactly are they doing what is this business about from your name they should be able to easily tell what you are so for my business for example we're called afro hub if you know what afro is afro is black hub is a home technically so we are a place where black businesses are able to share their products now when your business starts growing you don't necessarily have to have a name that people can easily say oh this is what they do now that is because at that point your name is already within the names of people within the minds of people so it's not it's not compulsory for your name to be easily to easy to identify the kind of business you're in but at the beginning it's very important so think about general motors you hear general motors you already know that it's, it's a motor company it's a vehicle complaint um it has to do with maybe electric or something like that when you hear tesla except now that people are already associating with the brand at the beginning you're probably wondering what is a tesla so sometimes businesses start off with a name that people actually can easily resonate but once they start building some level of capacity when they have a particular product that is maybe their best seller they then rename their company to fit into that product and that way people already have an idea of what they are and so the name always will bring a bell whenever you have to choose a name things that you should avoid don't make sure say anything like oh your name is afflicted with a royal company so royal homes royal clothing so all those things they most likely would not work out really well the government will most likely not accept them also when you are creating a name you shouldn't have anything that says you are affiliated to the government if you are not affiliated to the government so things like parliamentary premiers or government or the name of your city all those things you probably don't want to put that there because it might look like you are affiliated to the government and you might not get an acceptance for that also it must not be interpreted as obscene and it's don't make it seem like it's not a true description of the nature of the firm's business so um for example if i say um clothing and then i my business is not anything related to clothing that might seem a little bit fraudulent if i'm saying something um that is absolutely different that is not in in line with what i'm saying or something that is um seen as an abuse or something that is not accepted in the society that is maybe racist or genderist or sexist um that might be an issue when you're trying to register your name at the same time you can't use the name of a business that is already in business so a company that is already in business no matter how much you try to tweak it so like for example you can't say ibm tailors we already know what ibm is so you should probably use something different except you have a relationship with ibm and they've given you the opportunity or the the go ahead to actually use their name now i want us to look at the difference between an entrepreneur and a manager because i keep saying things like except there's a good management within the organization you most likely want to Think about it that you as an entrepreneur 
that doesn't necessarily mean you're a manager. You might be a great entrepreneur, but that doesn't mean you're a manager. So what are the characteristics of an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is usually creative. They're usually innovative. They're usually independent. They're risk takers. They're idea oriented or achievement oriented, like we talked about last week. However, when it comes to managerial, so managers, managers are not just thinkers. They don't just create things. They actually develop strategy. They set goals. They know outcomes. They are team players. They can work well and work through others. They're usually skilled in certain areas. So managers have to be more hands-on. They have to be more mellow than the entrepreneur who is just thinking about the big picture. Managers have to play it into smaller pictures for everything to work. Now, in terms of solutions, entrepreneurs usually will develop solutions to problems. They usually will start new businesses. They usually will think about new products, how to expand the business. But for managers, they are thinking more about, okay, how can we achieve our performance goals? How can we maintain operational control? So really what we're seeing here is you can be an entrepreneur, but you might not exactly be a great manager. You might be a manager, but you don't have the big ideas that you need to be an entrepreneur. Sometimes we have people that are the both of them. But depending on where you find yourself, it's always important for you to look for the other person that can help you. So in Afrohub, I think I am more of the entrepreneur. I can think about the ideas. I can think about, you know, how we can work around together. I created a big picture. I think about the new product. But in terms of developing strategy and setting goals, I do that. But I feel like there are other people in my team that do that perfectly well. And so when it comes to strategy, sometimes, I'm always having that back and forth conversation with another person on my team just because he's so great when it comes to developing strategy. He's so great when it comes to managing performance goals. And rather than trying to do everything, I would rather work hand in hand with him to get most of these things done. So it's important for you to know that you don't have to try to do everything by yourself because if not, you might lose the business rather than succeeding. And that comes back to answering the question, why exactly will small businesses succeed? You're able to succeed because you're allowed to change. The industry is going to change. Things are going to move around within the industry. So you need to be ready. You need to be aware. Okay, this might happen. What do we do when it happens? How do we do it? You know, you should be able to attract and retain competent employees. You should have your employee turnover really high. So people should not be starting work with you on Monday and quitting by Friday. You should be able to get the best of the best. Something good. People must see the best within your organization for them to apply to your company. You should stay close to your consumer. Don't go far away. In staying close doesn't necessarily mean only physical. Also, communication, conversation. Let hear from them. What do you know? What do you feel? How do you feel? You know, talk to your consumer so you can always um rediscover and revalidate that they actually need the solutions that you are providing. If their problem changes, then that means you need to change your solution. If you're sticking to, oh, this is the solution we created from the beginning, I don't care, you'll most likely lose consumers. So keep speaking to consumers, keep reaching out to them, and then you realize that, hey, maybe this is not such a bad idea. Also, you, you have to be thorough with operating details. What are your logistics like? What are the processes within the organization? If it is not thorough, if it is not clear, you're going to lose consumers because they would not feel like they're getting the best value from you. Also, you should be able to uh, obtain needed capital. So whenever it comes to making business sales, when it comes to getting money, if you're not able to get the capital that is needed, whether you're raising it internally or externally, that might reduce the opportunity or the chances of your business succeeding. And then when it comes to government laws and regulations, you must be on top of it. You must be ahead of it um, because if you are found wanting, that would be a bad record on your business organization. Aligned with that, let's see why are the reasons why businesses will fail. So I'm, I've divided them into two perspectives. So external shocks, because businesses do not live in isolation. You operate within an economy, so you have to be cognizant of what is happening within your economy because that would affect your business. And then management problems, which are more internal, based on the manager and how you operate. So for in terms of external shocks, um, when there's a downtown in the economy, so COVID, for example, happened and they had to be closed down, this most likely affected almost all businesses. So that it could affect them positively or negatively. But in this situation, we're looking at it from the negative perspective. So when there's a town, downtown in the economy, when there are changes in the economy, maybe changes in interest or currency rates, especially if you're doing international transactions, it might affect your business. And if you don't have the right systems to manage it immediately, you might actually lose your business. All right, when there's new competition, when there's loss of customers and loss of suppliers, when there's a change in laws and regulations, these are things that are outside the organization but can influence how effective or otherwise the business is. So you have to put into put this into consideration just to be sure that you have everything checked. 
Also from the internal part, the management problems. If you're starting a business with insufficient funds, that means you might not get the best resources. That is really never good for your business. And you have to take a look at that because it might lead to failure of your business. If you're not able to control your costs, you can manage your costs, you can manage your operations, that might lead to failure in business. And that aligns back to what we said earlier, having the right skill set to work through your processes within the organization. Also, if you have problems with attracting and retaining competent employees, um, you don't have the right employees that are working within your organization, that is not really a good sign because um, you wouldn't get the best skills, you wouldn't get the best knowledge and capabilities. And so you might actually see yourself as an organization dwindling just because you don't have the right competent employees. If you're not able to manage well, if you're not able to think about competition, think about expansion very well, if you grow too fast, growing too fast is also a problem because you've not put out the right processes, the right structure, and that might determine, um, that might lead to failure. Also burnout. So sometimes we put in so much work into our business um, just because we want to make it grow. But you have to consider the fact that you are still a human being, especially if it's an entrepreneur and it's a one man business. So if you don't consider that, you realize that you would most likely burn out. You might end up losing the business, getting ill or even just not being interested anymore and then if you rely too much on just specific customers that's a big problem you have to expand your customer base you have to find out what your customers want and keep providing those solutions for them and then when there's lack of financial skills so that also goes back to failure to control cost this might be a major problem and this might lead to your business failing. So these are the major reasons why businesses would fail. And so what we're seeing here now is just understanding what the business structure is, what the forms of ownership are. Why are we doing all of this? Because we want to ensure that the business is able to succeed. We want to ensure that every business is able to grow if you put in the right structure from the beginning. So having this at the back of your mind, every other thing that you're doing moving forward, it's easier for you to put in the right processes because you know what failure looks like and you know what success looks like. Like. And so you're able to put in the right processes, the right structure that will lead to more um, success. All right. Thank you very much. Um, have a good rest of your day.